Okay, we're going to do some literary and rhetorical devices. A lot of these you've already learned at some point. Some of them may be new. Um, so that way you can move on and do your unit project. So let me go ahead and share my screen with you. Okay. So we're first going to start with our standards and our I can statements. Um, we're going to start with L9105, demonstrate understanding of figurative language, word relationships, and nuances and word meanings. We are specifically looking at part A, interpret figures of speech in context, including but not limited to euphemism and oxymoron, and analyze their rhetorical function in the text. And then we're also going to look at our RL 9101, cite relevant and thorough textual evidence to support analysis of what the text says explicitly, as well as inferences drawn from the text. So your I can statements are going to be I can interpret figures of speech in context and analyze their rhetorical function in the text, and I can support my analysis with textual evidence. First thing we're going to look at is what even is rhetorical function. Um, most of the words from those standards are going to be something that you can break down. You can understand their words that are common to us, but rhetorical function is not one of those. So rhetorical function is just a set of rules that allows authors to persuade readers to agree with their writing. Okay, that's great, but makes sense in nonfiction text, but what in the world would that do in fiction if we're not persuading anyone? Um, they make your writing more interesting. They help to describe an object or a character or a setting or, or anything in the story, and then they deepen that story. So it makes it more fun to read when there are things in there to pick apart. It's not just, just one simple little story. This is a list of rhetorical and literary devices. Is this a complete list? Absolutely not. There are more here more literary and rhetorical devices than we could possibly talk about in a year, let alone in a class period. So these are the most common ones that we're, and we're going to look at all of these. Um, some of these you already know. Some of them are going to be new or new-ish. Our first one is alliteration. Alliteration is the repetition of initial consonant sounds. So remember, consonants are everything but vowels. So no A, E, I, O, or U for alliteration. Um, that is its own thing, and we'll talk about that when we do poetry. We really dig into some more of these in poetry. Um, Peter Piper peck, picked a peck of pickled peppers. Sally sells seashells by the seashore. Any of those, alliteration. It's a repetition. The next one is an analogy. An analogy is just comparing one thing to another. Life is like a box of chocolates usually is going to say something like is like or something of the sort, but not not always. Sometimes it's a little deeper than that. you got to dig a little bit further. Um, I don't know if they have students do them anymore, but they used to have us do analogies all the time. They would give us like two semicolon or a semicolon, one word on one side. So if it was like green is to tree as yellow is to banana, you had to do your analogies. I don't know if they still do that or not, but that's what analogy is. It's just comparing one thing to another. Then we get into things like characterization. So creating a fictional character um, with their character traits and their character development. So obviously character traits, they're like, are they positive? Are they negative? Um, what are their opinions? That kind of stuff. And then their development is how do we... How do we see that character emerge as we go through the story? And then the next one is hyperbole. It's a very common one, I'm sure. Um, it's just an over-exaggeration. He's running faster than the wind. This bag weighs a ton. That man is tall as a house. Uh, this is the worst day of my life. Is he really faster than the wind? No, maybe, depending on how fast the wind is blowing that day, but probably not. Does that bag really weigh a ton? No, it does not. So it's just an over-exaggeration. It's the biggest fish I've ever caught. 
Oh, it was the size of a whale. Was it? No. Um, connotation and denotation. Um, these are two that may be newer to you. Or maybe you've seen them, but we've not really used them. So denotation is the literal meaning of the word. And connotation is the implied meaning of that word. And it's like when we talk to someone and they, they say a word... And they're like, well, I didn't mean it like that, but they did because that word has its own meaning. So questioning, questioning would just be asking a question about something. That's the literal meaning. That's his denotation. But Miss Susie down the road being nosy, she's questioning, but nosy has a negative connotation. Or if you are interested in something, I'm really interested in that. Or even Miss Susie down the road. She's really interested in what you're doing. But interested has a positive connotation where negative would be nosy. The next one, um, we talk about these a lot um, this year, especially when we do our short story unit. Um, foreshadowing and flashback. So foreshadowing is where the author's dropping us hints all throughout the book as to what's going to happen. Um, hopefully, we will get to read a book after Christmas that has some excellent foreshadowing in it. Um, a common example that everyone should know, everyone has probably, I would hope, read or watched Charlotte's Web at some point, and Templeton the Rat gets this rotten egg, and they were like, oh, a rotten egg, that's a stink bomb waiting to happen. And he was like, oh, no, I would never break it, no. And then, obviously... That's the author telling us that it's going to get broken. And that is indeed what happens. It gets broken. It smells horrible. Um, so it's foreshadowing. They're dropping us hints for what's to come. Flashback is really common too. That's when your author flashes the reader back in time to give you more information. Sometimes this flashback is really obvious. Like when you're watching a movie and it just, the screen changes. You can tell that you've just flown back in time. Sometimes this flashback is not obvious. Sometimes your entire book is written as a flashback and you don't realize it until you get to the end. Those are the really good ones. Um, the Wreck of the Zephyr, I remember reading this one when I was young. I don't know who else has, but the, in the Wreck of the Zephyr, basically this, this man is traveling along the seashore and he stops and he sees this boat crash in like the weirdest place. And there's a man down there. And so he like goes to ask him, like, are you okay? Do you know what happened? And the man starts to tell him a story about this little boy who in his dream one night, his dream was sailing this boat out. Um, and there was a big storm. He got caught in the storm and he got wrecked on this island and he broke his leg and all this stuff. And, and then when he gets back, like no one believed that that's what had happened. And he's been spending his life searching for that island all over again. Um, and when he gets up, he walks away with a limp. So we can tell that this old man was the little boy from the story. He had flashed back to tell us his story. Um, and the, the limp is what lets us know that that it, it is. Um, the book never says, this is the story of this man. It leads you to infer that that was the story um, by dropping you those, those flashback hints. The next one, um, I'm sure you're very familiar with, irony and sarcasm. Um, irony and sarcasm can be great literary devices. Um, but you a really good author can work them in seamlessly. So obviously, irony is using language that means the total opposite of what they're trying to say. Um, I think of the Atlantis Morissette song, Isn't It Ironic? Um, this was one I found on the internet. Nothing is written in stone and it's on a stone. Thank you for driving carefully and it's a wrecked car. Just irony. Um, when we look at irony, there's different types of irony that we look at and we'll actually do an irony lesson later. Um, but for this one, I just want you to be able to point out irony um, as just we get started here. Um, and then the next one is sarcasm. So that's using irony to mock a concept. Oh, that looks super safe. It's not really. Um, some of you are excellent with sarcasm. 
This one, very you ought to be very familiar with simile and metaphor. Simile is a comparison of two things using like or as. Um, the one thing that trip students up though is sometimes they think that simile should just like be there like flashing at them like a, a neon sign. It's not always. Sometimes it's harder um, to find just because it's not simple like food, Chris inquired, popping out of a seat like a toaster strudel. Sometimes the, the words around it are complex and sorry. Sorry about that. Sometimes the words around it are, um, they're more complex and they're harder to understand. Um, so readers will skip over that whole section and they're missing that whole, the whole simile because they're skipping over the section because it has some complex words in it or, or the whole section looks complex and they just don't want to read it. And then metaphor, um, generally something that my sophomores understand, sometimes not, but we're comparing two unlike things. They're not alike at all. Um, by stating that it is something else. Fill your paper with the breathings of your heart. Can your heart breathe? No, your lungs breathe. And the words that you're putting on paper, they're not, they're not from your heart. They're from your brain. But that's what we're saying. But we know that when he says with the breathings of your heart, it means the words that you're putting on your paper and they're, they're your deepest desires. But we're just comparing them that way. Or let us be grateful to people who make us happy. They are charming gardeners who make our souls blossom. We're comparing our souls to flowers. They're blooming. And grateful people, they're gardeners. They are just working right there with our dreams and, and to make us blossom as people. It just wouldn't have been quite as fun just to say people are great and they really help us. Um, a lot of people don't think about puns when we're thinking about literary devices, but they are really good ones. So plays on, I love puns, plays on words. Um, a lot of people avoid them because they're cringy, but they're a great way to, to get your point across and to deepen your meaning as an author. Gary, you need to be less selfish. Remember, it's cactus, us, <laughs> Actually, sweetie, the plural is cacti. So it's okay to be selfish there. Gary the grammar cactus will never find love. How funny. Onomatopoeia, that's one that y'all get easy, easy, easy. Boom, bang, crash. I think of comic books when I think of onomatopoeias. Next is tone and mood. Um, so tone and mood are very easily confused. Tone is the writer's attitude. Mood is the atmosphere of the writing piece. Mood is generally very affected by tone. So some mood words are things like optimistic, excited, confused. Some tone words are things like comical, hostile, and partial. So we might, our mood, the atmosphere of the writing piece, might be excited, because our author has a comical tone or an optimistic mood because they have a comical tone. Theme and symbolism. Theme, you ought to know what theme is because we drill theme pretty hard. Um, but that's that lesson that the author wants us to learn from a text. So courage, honesty, loyalty, hope, those are themes. So we should ask ourselves, what did they learn? How did they grow? And then symbolism, we've talked a lot about symbolism in our first two units, but just a reminder, it's a person, a place, or an object. I left out all the commas there. That's just terrible. Um, a person, a place, or an object that means something else. So um, a rose might not symbol be an actual rose or they have a flag flying it's flying that flag flying could mean different things if it's white it might mean surrender if it's an american flag it's patriotism um 
anything black in color can sometimes signify evil and death and mystery. Um, there's a whole uh, section of color symbolism that is um, very valid to literature. Idioms, probably, the word idiom is probably new to you, but you know idioms. Um, so it's just a group of words that mean something different than what it says. It's raining cats and dogs. She kicked the bucket. It's like finding a needle in a haystack. Is it really raining cats and dogs? No, it's pouring, but we say it's raining cats and dogs. Did they really kick a bucket? No, they died, but we say we kicked the bucket. Um, personification is something you all get very well. And that's giving human traits to non-human objects. Um, makes me think of The Brave Little Toaster, which was a movie uh, that was very popular in my house when I was growing up. Um, but it's all of these little appliances, and they all have their own characters and traits and qualities, and they go about and they solve all of these issues. Um, but there's personification and lots of other things. And then lists of three. So when an author uses three things when describing something in a story, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, it's not a story, but blood, sweat, and tears. Again, I forgot my commas there. Didn't proofread well enough, apparently. Um, but lists of three is just they strengthen your story as they go along. And then the last one that we look at is logos, pathos, and ethos. We look at these pretty, uh, pretty strong when we do debates and nonfiction writing, but they also apply to fiction as well. So logos, that's appealing to logic. Um, so like statistics, facts, reasonable arguments, logical organization of information. Um, so L for logic. Pathos, that's appealing to your feelings. So heartwarming stories or heart-wrenching stories. Um, personal experiences, jokes, really sad photographs. When I think of pathos, I think of that ASPCA commercial with those like poor little dogs and Sarah McLaughlin singing that song. And it just makes you want to cry watching it. Um, and then the last one is ethos. And that's appealing to credibility and trust. So that's things like quotes from professionals, customer reviews, celebrity endorsements. That's a big one for ethos. Um, and like personal qualifications, things like that. So though these are more similar or more common to be found in nonfiction writing, especially the logos and the ethos, um, you do see quite a bit of pathos in fictional writing, but you can also see, you can see any of them really. So last thing we're going to look at is your unit project. So I'm going to stop sharing here. And I'm going to share There we go. Um I'm going to share with you your project. So this is your um just lays out your project for you um, and your rubric. And I'm obviously going to post this. So in this project, you're going to create a flip book, a video, a presentation. The sky is the limit here. You have complete creative control over what your project will look like. Um, but for the rhetorical and literary devices found in the VELT. So we write it, the VELT last Monday. Um, so we're going to go through there and pick out, um, rhetorical and literary devices. So you need a title slide that's worth five points. So if you're doing, uh, a flip, a flip book, you need a title page. If you're doing a video, um, maybe you need to put in like a slideshow when you animate, um, whatever it is, you need a title of some sort with your name, your class period, and the title of your project. You need a table of contents. If you're doing a video, just give me like a short, um, these are the things we're gonna talk about today. Um, and then you need a minimum of five different literary or rhetorical devices. 
Um, I've went through the story and I've marked it. And there are 11 or more from this list that I just gave you. It's on this page as well. 11 or more literary devices in the story developed. So you have to pick five of those 11. Some of those are like right in your face, right there, things like theme and symbolism. Some of them you have to dig, dig a little deeper for, but they're there. So you need at least five. And for each one, you should have the name of that literary or rhetorical device. That's worth three points, five times each. For each section, it's worth five, three points. The definition of that literary rhetorical device, um, I'll post the slideshow that I just used. You can copy and paste it straight from there, or you can Google it. Um, again, three points times five sections, so 15 total points there. You need the direct quote from the story, providing textual evidence. That's where that um, standard I can our um, I can statement for today, the uh, I can provide textual evidence for my analysis. You need that direct quote providing textual evidence. That's worth six points, so double everything else times five sections. Then you need some sort of illustration, picture, graphic, something. So if you're making a video, you probably need a PowerPoint to play while you do your video. Um, but you need some sort of, of illustration. Um, if you're drawing it yourself, that's great. If you are pulling it from the internet, please include the hyperlink where you got it. Um, I'm not gonna make you go through and do uh, like a full citation of where you got it in MLA format like I made you do for the last project, but I do need to know where you got it from, uh, giving people credit for the work that is theirs. Um, and again, that's worth three points times five sections. And then the next thing is going to be your explanation. How do you know that that quote that you found is that literary rhetorical device? And you need at least, at least in a, like a well-formed sentence or two. You may need more than that. So you can use, it's a total of 100 points when you put it all together. Um, you could use Prezi. You could use Google Slides. You could screencast Google Docs. Um, you could make it on paper and take pictures of it as long as I can read what you're doing. Um, sky's really the limit here, guys. But um, if you make it somewhere like Prezi or like a Powtoon or something like that, you have to download the link or the presentation so you can turn it in. You can't just say, well, I did it here. And then if I can't see it, you, you're not going to get your points. Uh, I can't grade it if you don't turn it in. So you have one week to complete this. So this is Monday. You have Monday through Friday. And then next week, I'm not assigning anything new. Next week is all makeup because uh, it's the last week before Christmas break. So if you have, if you are able to complete this, there will be um, time to go back and finish anything that you might be missing. And then if you're completely caught up, um, I have an extra credit opportunity for you. Um, so you have this week to complete this uh, project. And then this down here is just your list, the same ones that I just gave you. They're techniques that, author use, that authors use to engage their audience. Um, and these are common ones. There are other ones. So if you find one in there that's not on the list, you're welcome to use it. Um, you just defend your answer. There we go. Um, so that's all of it. If you have any questions, um, just like always, you can email me. You can call me at the school. If I don't answer, just leave a message. I'll call you back. Um, you can message me through Google Classroom. All that good stuff. You all know how to get a hold of me by now. Um, so that's your project. And it's due. We'll do Sunday at midnight is when it's due. So if you have any questions, just let me know.